Welcome back AP Calculus AB students. Mr. Record here from Avon High School getting ready to dive in to our second example for topic 4.1. Now you're going to want to use a graphing calculator for this particular question so you might want to pause the video if you don't have access to it right now and grab it. Um, preferably you want to use the calculator that you would likely be using on the day of the AP exam. Once again, we're talking about interpreting the meaning of a derivative in context. We're going to the gravel plant. So let's take a look. This is from the 2003 operational exam. This was AB1 that year. And it says on a certain weekday or workday, the rate in tons per hour at which unprocessed gravel arrives at a gravel processing plant is modeled by g of t equals 90 plus 45 times the cosine of t squared over 18. t is measured in hours and t lies between 0 and 8 exclusively or inclusively. That means we include 0 and 8. At the beginning of the workday at time 0, the plant has 500 tons of unprocessed gravel. During the hours of operation between time 0 and 8, the plant processed gravel at a constant rate of 120. Uh, tons per hour. Now there's a lot of information in the stem of that question. We're not going to use all of it just to answer our part A because a lot of these other questions that can come from this are going to be things that we haven't quite learned yet uh, being now that we're just at the beginning of unit 4. So we are only concerned with part A which is find g prime of 5 and then using correct units, interpret your answer in the context of the problem. A perfect 4.1 lesson. So what we're going to have to do to find g prime is to take the derivative of g, of course. But one of the things that you have to understand is that the author of this question, the team that wrote this problem, wants you to use technology. They want you to punch this into your calculator and let it do all the work. So there is, there's, there's no style points or bonus points if you were to take this derivative by pencil and paper. And I'm not saying that you couldn't because it's not an impossible derivative. You could certainly take it. But my question is why? Why would you want to take this by pencil and paper? So you're going to go ahead and grab that graphing calculator and let's figure out what g prime of 5 is. So the calculator that I'm going to use, of course, is my TI Inspire. But I want you to know that if you're out there watching and you don't own a TI Inspire, but maybe have a TI-84, which is probably the most common calculator out on the market, you can still do this. And I'll kind of talk you through the process that you would use with that particular model. But the very first thing that we want to do is reconcile us to the fact that we want to compute the derivative at a point in time, right? That was time five, if you recall. We're trying to find the derivative of g with respect to, to time and insert five. Now, what I'm going to do is I will go to my menu and choose the option calculus and choose the option derivative at a point. Now what that will do is it'll bring up this menu that allows me to input my independent variable and the value at which I want to take the derivative. And I can choose if I want a first or second derivative. And of course, in this case, I want a first derivative. So if I want to enter this problem exactly the way that it's worded, I might use the variable t because that was the variable within my original question. There's nothing wrong if you want to change that variable to x. Sometimes I think that's a good idea because you can then use that equation that's generated and you could actually graph it. And that's something that we can talk about in a later video. The value that we're going to compute this at, according to our problem, was 5, right? We're going to find g prime of 5. And then once I hit OK, it basically brings me to my derivative template such that the time is 5. Now, for those of you who have a TI-84, you can get there pretty quickly. If you type in math 8, that's the in deriv command, you will essentially see the same template. You just have to enter the variable t and the value 5 on your own from that home screen. Not a big deal. So I'm going to go ahead and enter this g of t. I know I've switched away from my document, but I'm going to remind you that it was 90 plus 45 times. We don't need the times, but I'm going to go ahead and put it 
just uh, to make sure. And then if you recall, I had a fraction here where the numerator was t squared and the denominator was 18. This is going to do all of the work for us. Now, for those of you that might use a TI Inspire CAS model, computer algebra system, I want to warn you, if you hit enter, the calculator is going to show off and give you this really wonderful exact answer. <laughs> That's wonderful. We will accept that on the AP exam, but it's probably acceptable as well, or maybe even more acceptable to approximate that. And I just hit control enter to make that happen. By the way, another little subtle fact is if you had entered that original expression with a decimal anywhere after one of those numbers, it would automatically give you the decimal version. So that's the value that we're going to take from our calculator, negative 24.5875, I'll call it for now, and we're going to return to the document. So here we are back at the document. Let me adjust my window here just a little bit. Okay, just as long as you can all see me. <laughs> and I'm going to go ahead and enter our findings. We knew that g prime of 5, and I think it's really nice if we can go ahead and write it up as such, g prime of 5, was approximately equal to uh, that decimal negative 24.5875. Now, please understand something. You need to round to at least three decimal places, so it would be perfectly fine to have stopped here at 7, or you could have rounded that up to an 8. You can go either way with this. Let's say I take it up to an 8. At that point, any value that appeared after this 8, the readers, we would not even acknowledge them, even if they were incorrect. So it's best to not add additional <laughs> decimals, but you can round or truncate. So that would be our value. So the next thing that we need to do is think about, well, what would the label be? Let's go ahead and put that label here just for the heck of it. And then we'll use that label again. This is a little tricky because in this problem, what we have here on a certain workday is we have what is called a rate. And this rate is this thing called g of t, it says. So when we take the derivative of this rate, we have to think about what does that do with the units. Because the units are already tons per hour. But by taking the derivative, we have shown how that changes over time. And therefore, we have another per hour or a denominator of hours. So you would use the numerator tons per hour. And then you could divide that by hour, which of course is the same as tons per hour squared. And oftentimes we see it written as such, because if you think about the hour and the denominator as being written over one, you could multiply by its reciprocal and boom, um, you have the situation where um, uh, your, your two hours are gonna be multiplied because this per is already in and of itself a mini division problem. Here's what I mean. Tons per hour divided by hours is the same as multiply by one over hours. So either way would work. You could say tons per hour squared and that would be fine. In fact, I'm gonna use that notation in the second part of the problem. Now, interpret this answer. This is where things can get a little bit tricky because you want to use the acronym NUT. Remember from a different previous video, we talked quite a bit about our good friend NUT. Noun, number, units, and time. So what we have discovered is that this rate is undergoing a change. And we see that this change is that of a negative consequence. So we could invoke the word decreasing. I think that's very, very important here. So what is it that's decreasing? Is it the amount of gravel? Well, no, it's this attribute of the gravel. It's the rate. And that's why I circled that value to really emphasize that that is the noun in our particular problem. So one of the ways that we could write this up is the rate. 
And then you could say a variety of things. Um, the rate um, at which the gravel would certainly be a nice grammatically correct way to phrase this. This is what I really try to emphasize with my students. The rate at which the gravel and what is the gravel doing in this problem? That's a good question at the beginning. Well, it is arriving. That would be your verb here. So the rate at which the gravel, um, let's say, is or arrives, the rate at which the gravel arrives. Now, if you want to say other things like um, at the plant, that's great but that's not really necessary. Things that aren't necessary, I might put in parentheses. You could say unprocessed if you want to be a little bit more descriptive about that gravel, but you don't have to do that. As long as you convey the general noun number, we are going to be perfectly fine with your response. So the rate at which the gravel arrives at the plant is, well, we said decreasing, right? It is decreasing. So you're really getting that context. All I need now is the answer. Well, we know it was decreasing by 24.588. And the label would be tons per hour squared. So there's where I want to use that abbreviated version of that units. And then the only thing left, well, we got the N, we've got the U, we need the T. Remember, what is the most important pronoun when you're interpreting the meaning of a derivative? At. What's our time? T equal. And just go back to the question and you can see, oh, it was T equal 5. And 5 was measured in hours in this case. And that would give you full credit. You would have earned the first point over here on the rubric box for computing the g prime of 5 correctly, and then the interpretation with the units would earn the second point. A lot of qu uh, common questions I get from both students and teachers is, do you have to put the units in both the answer and the explanation? And the answer is no. It, it needs to appear at least once, and the best place to put it without exception is probably going to be your explanation. But I tell my students, Go ahead and put it both times to play it safe. Now, I called this the gravel problem part one because we're going to be looking at this gravel problem much later in our course, if you're a student of mine, because we're going to be able to tackle some of the other parts as we start to learn more calculus. Stick around because I've got another video, uh, the final one in the series for 4.1, that's going to talk about some more interpretations of a derivative that has to do with wind chill. Ooh, got cold just saying that. Thanks for joining. We'll see you next time.